Hi, welcome. Uh, I apologize that I am doing this in a recorded fashion and not live, but uh, this year was scheduled a long time ago, and then our son Tzadok has a uh, ceremony in the army in which he is receiving Chayel Metztayen, an excellent soldier, outstanding soldier. So uh, that is uh, in motivating me to record it first. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, today's topic because I think many aspects of the Makot are discussed, but this question about how dangerous they are, how deadly they are, is not discussed as much, and it actually has implications for many other topics about the Makot, for their purpose, for how the warnings work, and the like. So let's get down to business and ask the question. Now, when we're asking if the Makot were deadly, we are obviously not asking about the 10th Makot. Clearly, that's exactly what Makot Bechor is. But what about the first nine? Are they a nuisance? Are they life-threatening? Are they somewhere in the middle? How should we understand the severity of the makot? So I think someone might ask, well, let's start with Dom right away, right? Not having blood for, a, not having water, excuse me, for a seven-day period, obviously could be extremely dangerous. However, it is not clear at all that there was no access to water. Uh, in fact, let's start with the source sheet. So if we look at today's source sheet, we'll discover that the Ibn Ezra makes a very basic point, uh, which is that, wait, recall that the Khartoumim, the Egyptian sorcerers, are able to replicate the miracle. Now, that must mean that they have access to water, right? If all they have was blood, then there's nothing they could do. So indeed, the Ibn Ezra in source one says, where did the Khartoumim find water? And he answers... And the second line, Aaron Aaron converted the water that was above the surface. But they could dig underneath and access water. And that's what the Khartoumim did. And they converted that water to blood. But be that as it may, that means there was access to water. It was a difficulty, but not an insurmountable difficulty. No one should have died as a result of Makata. Okay. Let's move on to some of the patterns. It's always interesting to look at the patterns of the Mako, and perhaps not just patterns, but development, how things progress. So one of the interesting things is that when you get to the fourth Maka, all of a sudden the Torah says that God divided between the Egyptians and the Jewish people. And with the fifth Maka, we have the same thing as well. But of course, the question arises, wait, if it only in the fourth and fifth Maka says that Hashem differentiated between the Egyptians and the Jews, that would seemingly indicate that, what about the first three? Did he not differentiate? Did the Jews suffer from those Makot as well? Did they also deal with the blood? Did they also deal with the frogs and the lice? So believe it or not, that's exactly what the Ibn Ezra says. So if we look at source number two, if we look at the Ibn Ezra in line two, so the Ibn Ezra says, Ulafi dati, in my opinion, ki makad hadam v'hatsfardim v'akinim, those first three plagues, hayta kolelet ha-mitzriim v'avrim, both the Jews and the Egyptians suffered from them, ki achar ha-katuv nirdof, we're running after the psukim, meaning he says the psukim only discuss differentiation in Makkah 4, so that must mean that the first three were universal, everybody in Egypt had to confront them. And now, of course, the question would be, well, why is that? Certainly the plagues are meant for the Egyptians and not the Jews. Says the Ibn Ezra, these three, ma'at heziku, they're really not so dangerous. They don't cause such extensive damage. And therefore, it was okay. But apparently, when you get to a rove, endeavor, then things get more dangerous. Raka makat arov, shayta kasheh, there Hashem yifrish ben amitzrim uven Yisrael. There, God felt the need to distinguish. So a couple of interesting things. First of all, for Ibn Ezra, at least we know the first three were certainly more nusa, more of a nuisance than a deadly affair. And one could certainly, we've already worked that out for the blood. Frogs also, one could argue, frogs are a pain in the neck, but hardly deadly. One could say the same for lice. So the Ibn Ezra says we have things that are bothersome, and the bothersome things happen both to the Egyptians and the Jews. And maybe there's something more going on here. It could be according to Ibn Ezra, right? We do have a sense that the Jews in Egypt maybe also weren't as worthy as we would have wanted. And maybe Magilam as were, they uh, deserve some kind of uh, 
I don't know, suffering is too strong a word, but uh, some kind of reminder about the makot, about the need to, uh, you know, uh, improve their spiritual and ethical behavior. So at that point, uh, maybe it makes sense for Ben Ezra that the first three happen to the Jews also. And then when things get more serious, then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, uh, they have to uh, differentiate between the Jews and the Egyptians. Of course, here, we're still not sure how, mo how much we're talking about when we say more serious, right? Ma'at Heziku, does that move on to deathly things or no, just things that are a much larger problem? Okay, but not necessarily yet deathly, but certainly if you've been Ezra, the first three are not such a big deal. And by the way, I'll just point out, this is not really my topic, but in terms of working out patterns, at some point, Paro starts to make counter offers where Paro will say, okay, uh, you can worship, but worship here in Egypt, or you could go, but don't take your children with you, right? Various counter offers as it's developing. And it seems that as the Mako are developing, Paro feels more and more pressure, right? So we see what's going on. So the first time Paro makes a counter offer is indeed after the fourth Maka. So for Ibn Ezra, that works very nicely. So that's, in, I'm not going to read it inside, but that's source three pretty much, that now that uh, things are getting more difficult, now that things are getting more difficult, but now that Paro sees the hand of God separating between the Jews and the Egyptians, so that could create a certain amount of greater fear and reverence for the Jewish population. And that's why Paro starts to make counter offers. Okay. I will just point out that that's not the only way to understand what's happening in the first three Makot. So if we go to source four, the Rashbam, another of the medieval uh, Pashtanim, so he disagrees with Ibn Ezra. He says, look at source four, why is God differentiating in Makot four? Ah, this is a Makot of animals, of animals that are quite mobile. And they will tend, if they're in one part of the kingdom, they will tend to move to the other part of the kingdom. Where, and therefore, says the Ibn Rashbam, I'm on the second line now, Hutzrach Lomar Lashon Habdallah Vahfrasha Yoter Mishar Makot. That's why there was a need to discuss separation more than the other Makot. The Chain Bedever Shel Behemot. So now, what emerges for Rashbam? It is not that the first three affected the Jews, they did not. But there was no need to point it out, right? Dam just stays stable, doesn't move, right? Uh, I guess you would have to argue that the Kinim stay where they are. And Sfardeya, same as same thing. He would, again, Rashbam would have to argue that Sfardeya somehow is less uh, mobile animal than what's involved in Arov. And therefore, there was no need to talk about or they didn't spread to Goshen or to where the Jews lived. But when you get to Mako that are much more uh, movable, mm -hmm much more mobile, so then you need to point it out. Okay, so be that as may, if the Rosh Bam is right, then we don't have Ibn Ezra's point here about the first three. But if we go with Ibn Ezra, then we indeed, once again, guys, to sum up the first uh, section here, for Ibn Ezra, the first three are a minor nuisance, and we don't know how much more serious they get as we go along. Okay, terrific. Let's now go to another issue of patterning. We already discuss when does God say, I'm going to separate between the Jews and the Egyptians. And we've mentioned how Paro starts to make counter offers and compromise suggestions. What about warnings? What kind of pattern do we see in the Mako between Mako plagues where God does warn the Egyptians beforehand and where God just instructs Moshe or Aaron or whatever to begin the plague without any kind of warning? So many, many commentaries notice that Makot 1 and 2, 4 and 5, 7 and 8 have a hatra, have a warning. And Makot 3, 6 and 9 do not. Okay, now it's hard to think that that's accidental, right? That's pretty remarkable and pretty consistent pattern. Two plagues with a warning, one without. Two plagues with a warning, one without. And indeed, Rashbam points that out in source 5. So he says, Shnei pamim hayamoshe matret paro. Every time you'd get a double warning, bishnei makot, right, maka one and maka two, uvishlishi loy matra, and in the third he would not, v'chein kol haseder, that's the way it works throughout the makot, v'chol shalosh makot eno matra, okay, so that's the way it works, two with a warning and the third without, which of course makes you suspect that maybe the makot are really groups of three, 
And I'm not going to develop it now because it's a little bit of a side topic for our purposes to today. But you'd have to work out, okay, what unifies the first three, what unifies the second three, and what unifies the last three. But let's assume that we can work that out. Many do. And then within each unit, that's the way it works. Within e And this demarcates the units by having two warnings and then the third without a warning, right? You are isolating each set of three makot. And therefore, by the way, it's interesting because when Pesach night in the Seder turns out that we say Ditzach Adash Bachav, it's not just a helpful mnemonic device, which indeed it is quite helpful. That's the way, the way most of us remember is the structure of the makot. But it's actually organizing them thematically. The tzach is one theme, and adash is a second theme, and bachav is a third theme. Okay, so great. So that's the way it works with hatra. Uh, I'll just, we'll see in a second, by the way, what the alternative to this is going to make it relevant to, to our topic. Okay, but I will point out, we could ask where makat b'chod fits in. Because maybe ba'achav, that little bed at the end for makat b'chor, maybe that's a mnemonic device. Maybe the reality is it's not that there's a set of three, a set of three, and a set of four, right? Wouldn't it be more reasonable to think there are three sets of three, two with a warning, and the third without? And indeed, makat b'chor, even literarily, is set aside, right, in shmot, right? We go through all nine makot in a row, and then there's, a, in Perikud bed, there's kind of a legal section about the laws of Pesach that precedes Makat Bechor. So even literarily, you have a sense of Makat Bechor belonging to a, a different structure. I would also point out Makat Bechor arguably is alluded to in Perg Dalit, right? In Perg Dalit, right near the difficult story at the inn when Moshe is in danger. So it says, uh, you'll say to power, right? There's a warning about, or not a warning, but there's a mention of the killing of a Bukhar. So there again, Makat Bukhar is singled out. So I just want to hold it aside for now. We will come back to this. The sense of maybe it's three sets of three and a one. It's really Ditzach, Adash, Baach, Bo, right? Bukhar is really a separate unit. Okay, we will come back to that thought. But for now, let's go to the alternative. What's the alternative to understanding this pattern of Hatra'ah? Why is it for certain Makot and not for others? So the Ramban raised an alternative that touches directly upon our topic. So look what it says here. Umash Amar Rabbi Avram, ki Moshe lo kinim. Right, Ibn Ezra notes that there's no warning before the third Makah, that of lice. There's no warning. Why? When do you get a warning? When human life is threatened. Now, obviously, for the Ramban, uh, we'll have to work out, does the pattern hold? Because now you're going to have to claim that, let's just do the easy one first. Which three maka were not life threatening? Three, kinim, lice. Six, shechin, boils. And nine, choshech, darkness. Now, that part's pretty easy to work out that three, six, and nine did not cause uh, danger or risk to human life. But now you'll have to tell me that all the others did. And some of them are going to be quite tricky, like it's Fardea, right? Is it going to be so easy to say that the frogs were somehow causing risk and causing human danger? Okay, now the later makot, things that certainly that hurt the crops, you could say, well, you don't have enough food, so people die. But what about that? Okay, so I, I should also point out another interesting thing about the Ramban is also a certain conception of how divinity works. So maybe we'll do that first before we get to the Tzfardeya question. So if we skip, I'm pointing to where we are now in the middle of the Ramban. This is mercy in God's part. Okay, basically, what's the idea? God would like, before he takes a human life, he always wants to be a warning, right? God would prefer repentance. He would prefer that no deaths occur. So therefore, there's a need for hatra before anything that might be deadly. But if it's a different kind of punishment, then it's not as crucial that there be a warning. So kinim, shechin, and choshech did not merit a warning because no one was going to perish as a result. But the other six of the first nine Mako did get a warning. 
Okay, so that's just the theological point about how divine justice and mercy works. But in terms of the Ramban's distinction, let's see if it really holds up. So what about Svardaya? Because as I said, I think Svardaya, most of us would imagine, is not so dead. So here, there's some interesting focus on verbs and which word is chosen. But where some of us are interested in the word no gaif, which is used right here, right? God promises to be your no gaif at kol gulcha bit What is a no, what is a nigifa associated with? What resonance does it have? But the Ramban brings in different evidence because the Ramban notes that there are prakim of sefer tilim that also list mako, two prakim that do it in so, in fact. And one of them is tehillim ayin chet. And what does it say there in tehillim ayin chet when it's poetically describing the makot? It uses the verb lahashchit. Says the Ramban, that's a powerful word. That's a word of destruction. Shurom is lamita, or a different kind of hashchata, right? He discusses even a medrash about castration. But the point is, the Ramban insists that Tzvardeya could somehow be deadly. And he works that out, or he bases support, he finds support in the parakintilim in the verb of lahashchit. Okay, so we've got the Ramban. And according to Ramban, I think we'd have to answer my question. Actually, a lot of them were deadly, right? So suffer in terms of, again, notice how we have this intersection of topics, right? Why do, does it sometimes only talk about the Jews and not the, the Egyptians, not the Jews, and other times it doesn't? Why is there sometimes a warning and sometimes there's not? And some of this keeps coming back to were the Mako deadly or not? And here for the Ramban, many of them were, at least six Mako before Mako Bechot for the Ramban had life-threatening implications. And that's why there was a warning. Okay, let's look a little bit more at this Friday issue. Because A, we're going to see how all these topics touch upon each other. There's going to be a language issue here and a ide animal identification issue here. Okay, so let's go to Rashi. Now, we noted, bef we noted before the Ramban is building on the verb of Lishahashchit in Tilim. But what about the verb that's used in Chumash proper, in our account of the second Maka? Here the verb is no gaif. What does no gaif mean? What kind of uh, what kind of wound does a nigifa make? So if you look at Rashi in source eight, Rashi says no gaif at kol gulcha, maka, v'chein kalashon magifa, eino lashon mita, el lashon maka. Now the Rashi is not addressing our question about the warnings, or sorry, about the question about the warnings, but he is addressing what Tzvardeh is. And he says, Tzvardeh, if the verb is going to be no gaif, a nagifa is something that strikes you, but does not kill you. And Rashi tries to claim that throughout Tanakh, that is what the verb nagifa does. There's a famous story where people are fighting and they injure a pregnant woman. And the claim is that, well, the pregnant woman doesn't die, right? Her fetus uh, is aborted. But therefore the claim is Nagfu, who is the victim of Nagfu? Nagfu Ishahara, and she's still alive at the end. So says Rashi, no gave is not a death uh, inducing kind of endeavor. So if that's true, already we'd work against Ramban. Friday is not deadly in the slightest. Okay, now let's go to a fascinating Barbanel. I'm curious if people are familiar with it because the Barbadell is both going to disagree on a linguistic plane and disagree about the classic identification of Tzvardim. Okay, now, if one wants to go in greater depth, which, again, we don't really have time permitting here, uh, there are other uses of Nigifa. Rashi quotes a whole number. It'll be interesting to see like who's going to win this battle about what the standard resonance of the verb no gaif is. But we're going to stick with our current example with Tzvardeya, and the example of Nagfu Hishahara. So let us go to the Abarbanel. So what exactly are these Tzvardim? So it's pretty uh, accepted that it's those, you know, fish-like things or th creatures of the water that make the sounds in the swamp. Namely, frogs, that's what it is. Ah, Rabbi Hananel Pirishem Abalechem Hagdolim Shebenilos. Because no, it's the big animals in the Nile River. Right, those you now uh, all know how to, you know, say uh, crocodile in Arabic. Very exciting. Okay, it's the same word in contemporary Arabic. So you could impress your friends at cocktail parties and say Al Timsach for Arabic crocodiles. 
But in any case, notice what he's saying. It's not at all a frog. It is something much bigger and much more ominous. Ah, now who's right? So most commentaries, they were not with uh, Rabbeinu Hanan on this one. But the Barbanel says, I'm going to go with a maverick position. I am not going to go with the rabbinic commentorial, uh, you know, consensus that it's frogs. I think it is, in fact, a uh, crocodile. And he says the opposite of Rashi, that Nagifa always is something deadly. A magefa is something that kills, not something that merely injures. Okay, so it's interesting that you have two Mepharshim using the same verb to bring opposite proofs, as it were. Rashi says, oh, if it's no gay, if obviously it's just injurious, it's not deadly. And here the Barbanel says, well, if it's no gay, it's obviously deadly. And then he says, what about Rashi's point? So let's skip to Velod Sadko, Divrei Rashi. Shekatev she'enu l'ashon mita, Rashi's incorrect. Va'edim shevi'elav lo yaspiku, his proofs are not good. Ki inei v'nagfu isha hara, nigifat hara, misadioto hara, hi mitat yiladeh. Right, there is a death in the story. It's a death of the fetus, right? If you abort the fetus, then some potential human life did not come to fruition. So at that point, even though it says v'nagfu ishara, maybe it's okay with using the verb nogeif because at the, at the end of the day, right, there is a death, and nagfu always constitutes uh, something deadly. So now for the for the barbanel. Right, he says, and frogs, since frogs don't tend to be particularly deadly, let us assume that uh, the Tzvaydeh was a crocodile. So again, here again, we have a split. If we go with the idea that it's frogs, it's a little bit harder to claim that something uh, risky to human life is going on. Uh, but if we go with the crocodile, it's much easier. And this might depend a bit on the, on the question of the words, right? How much should we build on the tail and batashritem? What is the implication of lahashrit something? How how destructive is that? And what is the resonance of no gaif, which we have a debate here between Rashi and the Barbanel? But again, if I am now Ramban or Barbanel, I now readily have a deadly maka right away in maka number two. Things get precarious pretty early in the game. Okay, before we get to the next issue, I want to go back a little bit to something I alluded to, but we didn't really see inside yet. And we're going to come back to this at the very end of today's year. Okay, the Svarna has a very interesting approach to the Makkot, uh, which it could impact greatly on our question. Okay, let us see the Svarna about the warnings. So the Svarna starts out, and it sounds like he's just like the Rashbam, and indeed he is, but then he adds an added element. And I should point out, the Sforno was a big humanist, right? He cared greatly about humanity, about ethical responsibilities, not just to Jews, but to non-Jews as well. This is manifest in his commentary in many places. Uh, I won't give a list right now, but just be aware. And I think this humanistic tendency of the Sforno is going to come to play here. So let's see what we have in Sforno in Source 6. The Haqqa Tafarats, lo hitrebe paro bezo. There's no warning in number three. not in six. not in nine. Vize. Now he's going to agree with Rashbam. There's a pad. There's a two-one pattern. Two-one, two-one, two-one. But look what he says. It's deeper than that. And I suggested this before that there's three sets of three and a one. That Bechor is set off. But maybe the three sets of three share some commonality. So in a certain sense, it's a nine and a one. That's the way to really think about the Mako. So here we go. How does it work? The first nine were signs and wonders, right? We have a repeating theme, a recurring theme throughout the Makot that God says, right? The Egyptian should get a message from the Makot. The Jew should get a message from the Makot. That's what it's all about. So, notice he says, not Ba'achat. The first nine makot were signs and warnings. That's what they were. They were a message. Ah, but what about the tenth? That was not a sign. That is a punishment. So now it's not just that the tenth maka is literarily set aside. It's not just that it's not part of the consistent pattern of three, three, three. It has a different purpose altogether. Nine makot, let's say, are some kind of message. And the tenth makah is actually a punishment. 
Okay, so let's file that idea away as we proceed here, because it may come back to be relevant. Okay, so now let's go to the next question. Okay, uh, before Barad, there's kind of this unusual phrase where God says, what am I going to bring upon the Egyptians now? I'm, now again, we're not right here before Maka 7. I'm going to bring at Koma Gefotai. Somehow it's not just a problem or a plague. It is Koma Gefotai. There's something all-encompassing about what's about to happen. Some kind of unified, all-encompassing punishment. Now, it's not clear at all why that would be true of Barad. Right. Again, it seems like, oh, after you say, I'm going to bring it, all my plagues, right? you'd think that, okay, the worst maka in history is coming. But not obvious that's true about Barad. So the Mepharshim struggle a bit with, is there something about Barad per se that is so terrible that it would be referred to as Koma So I'll just point out that the, there's one obvious logical alternative, that this is not a reference to Barad per se, but a reference to the series, to the sequence, right? If we've been arguing throughout this year that there's three sets of three, so right in between six and seven, right, you can, God can introduce the last set. So maybe it's not Bara that is Kalmage Fotai, it is the last set that is Kalmage Fotai. And again, the last set, either three or if one once, of four. So at that point, that would open up new possibilities that maybe somehow, it is not Barad that is worse, but it's actually Barad Arba Choshech that is worse. Okay, but we would still have to develop and work out exactly how it's worse. So let's look at two approaches here also, the Sforna and the Abarbanel. So the Sforna at 10 says, This third series, which has to do with things that come from the sky, Call Achat Melech Seshlach, all that, I'm mean, sorry, tenure on the second line, everything I send, Tia Belev Kulchem Gamachar Shetasur. Ah, why is it a big deal? Because it leaves a mark. There could be a maka that once it's gone, it's gone. And another maka that has long term damage. Says Svarna, when we get to the last three, right, or the last set of three, it's long term. I'm not going to go through all the first six, but obviously one could work this out. One could say, well, when the water is blood, it's bad. But once it's back to water, there's no long-term implications. When frogs are in all your nooks and crannies, it's incredibly irritating. But when the frogs are gone, it's over. Ah, but what's true about the last three? So the Sforna continues. Even afterward, right now you've been affected. Right, because the vegetation has been affected. And once vegetation is affected, so at that point, it's going to be much harder. But again, notice he doesn't use the word death. We've not seen that, but it'll be, it leaves an impact. Right, you'll have to struggle with much more limited food resources. And then he also says the same thing, and that's true about Barad and Arba, right? Barad and Arba decimate the produce. And Kemakara Choshech, Shekilkla Mezig Havir Belisa Fake. He must say that uh, it wasn't only a darkness, like the atmosphere was unhealthy. Uh, so he's sure that there was illness after Makar Choshech. So, but notice the Svarna, the word he did not use the entire time, he did not use the word death. But he does say that there's a increase in the long-term impact of the last set of Makar. So that's why it's called Magefotai. Okay, let us now turn to the Abarbanel, who also thinks we're talking about the set, but does not, uh, we've already seen that he sees death earlier in the game. He sees the Tzfardea as already being deadly. It was deadly crocodiles. So look what he says here. What's happening now? So first of all, he says, Kol Magefotai doesn't make sense. It's just the Barad. So he says in source 11, Hamnam Amu Kibapamazot and Nofi Shalech and Kol Magefotai, why would Barad be so much worse than anything else? Is the entire unit. But notice, okay, so it is a little different. I've been trying to argue, I think it's more reasonable that it's 333 three, three, and Maka is an independent unit. But Renel seems to be comfortable with it's 334. He does call Maka part of the last Siman. 
And he says, what is so bad about this? So now let's skip down to Kihine. Kihine Barad made hamikneva bemot Barad has animals dying and the men in the field with the animals. Baramagefa achat. Uva arba, what about the arba? Ba shna habitso, probably the famine. The himagifa chert. Shaachal arba klaes is devachal pia. It's you lose your vegetables, you lose your fruit. So he assumes that with such a calamity on your produce, it can't be that there wouldn't be death as a result of food shortages. So he has death there also. And then of course, right? So notice for the Sferno, what makes the last unit more difficult? What makes the unit more difficult is the long-term impact, the lingering effect, not necessarily deadly, but lingering effect, where for the Barbanel, things are getting more serious, including death, right? He associates Arbe with death, right? That the Arbe involves the uh, decimation of the produce. And when you have a limited food supply, people are going to die. And that's the more serious aspects of the, of Makat, of uh, excuse me, of the of the last unit that's introduced with the phrase called Magay Fotai. Okay, so let's just again take stop and pause before we get to the last two parts. Okay, what have we seen here? So we discussed how the issue of differentiating Jews and Egyptians could reflect on the severity of the Makot. We discussed how the warning to the Egyptians could reflect on the severity of the Makot. And now we're discussing whether this special introduction to the last unit could reflect on the severity of the Makot. What is happening when we're told that from seven and on, it will be a kol magifotai. All my plagues are coming to get the Egyptians. So now, if we are Ramban or Barbanel, there is a lot of death, right? That uh, I think we have to think about the Makot in harsher terms, right? For the Ramban in particular, what the Ramban tell us so far, Every time there's hatra, that's because there's a danger to human life. So for the Ramban, that must mean six makot were deadly before you get to makot b'chorot. And the Abarbanel, I'm not sure how much to count, but he certainly has a good deal of deadly items earlier in the game. Remember, the Abarbanel thought that Sfardea was deadly. And now the Abarbanel is telling us that the last series is called Kol Magei because God ups the ante. And things like Barad and Arba also were a source of human mortality. Okay, terrific. Okay, now let's get to the last two things, and we will see the humanitarian sphere is going to make his return. Okay, but before the humanitarian sphere makes his return, let's take a look at, at Makat Choshech. Okay, now we had this phrase before of Lokamo Ish Tachtav. Nobody got up. Now, what does that mean? And how would that reflect on how dangerous it was? Like, if you're really stuck in place, right, that's pretty dangerous to not be able to move for three days. And maybe that also in indicates that this was not just the darkness, but something much more sinister, right? Obviously, just because it's dark, it doesn't freeze you in place necessarily. It doesn't physically restrain you. So maybe we should try to figure out what exactly me it means lokamo ish mitachtav, and that will reflect on how dangerous choshech is. Okay, so let us look at source twelve or source source thirteen. Now most of us in elementary school get a heavy doses heavy dosage of Rashi and Midrash. Nothing wrong with that, but then we get a little older and discover there are other possibilities out there. So Rashi says, here we go, vahicho in source twelve. Okay, what is this darkness? So there's another three days. After three days where you can't see your brethren, a double darkness. But what does that mean? If you were sitting when the darkness started, you're not capable of getting up. The Omeid, if you're standing, ain't your holy shave. You're not capable of sitting. So Rashi interprets lo kamu ish mitachtav in very uh, literal restraining terms. There was something much more 
potent about this choshech. It's not just darkness. It's not just the absence of light. It is a choshech that restricts human movement, that prevents you from changing your position. So one can easily view this as a more damaging, a more dangerous kind of choshech. Okay. However, there is another possibility. Okay, when we go to source 13, when we go to the Ibn Ezra, so the Ibn Ezra says, says the Ezra, mi beto, kemo shavu ish mi tachtav. Mi tachtav just means, sorry, shvu, kemo shvu ish tachtav. He says, I can prove from other places that mi tachtav doesn't mean they didn't move. It means they didn't leave the house. That's what that phrase mi tachtav really means. Look at Shmo Tetzayim. But what are they told in Shmo Tetzayim after all? So that is the chapter about the man. And in Perak Tetzayim, Pasuk Haftet, we have Ru'u ki Hashem natan lechem ha-Shabbat. Akeinu natan miyom ha-shishi lechem yomayim. God gave you Shabbat and he gives you a double portion on Fridays. Shvu ish tachtav al yetzi ish mkomo biyom ha-shvi. Now, clearly, it doesn't mean that in the time of the man, they weren't allowed to move on Shabbat. It means don't go out of your house and search for man because there is no man on Shabbat, right? You're doing the wrong thing if you go searching for man on Shabbat. So here too, now why would they not leave the house? Says Ibn Ezra, Ki ana yelchu below or where they go without light. So it's not at all, according to Ibn Ezra, that there's something extra about this choshech. There's something more dangerous or more difficult about this restraining darkness. But rather... When there's no light, you don't leave the house. I think about the old days before electricity, right? So if it's dark in the streets, you stay at home. That's what we do, right? Uh, and therefore, no one left the house. But wouldn't it be a very different kind of choshech if I am in, in the Rashi camp or if I'm in the Ibn Ezra camp, right? If I am in the Rashi camp, one could easily argue there's something really dangerous about this choshech. Either one of two ways, either because not moving for three days is dangerous. You can't access your food, you can't access your water, you can't access any medication you might want. Right? So A, it could be dangerous on that level. And B, once we're saying it's a different kind of choshech, so maybe you'll go to uh, what the uh, Barbanel said, that there's a good, be, or Sfarna said, that this kind of choshech would have a sickness associated with it. Like it wasn't healthy to be in such an atmosphere. But if this choshech just means that nighttime goes on for a long time, it's like a three days of nighttime. It's simply that there's no day, there's no sun, it's dark. But at that point, you know, we don't die in the dark, right? You know, you can make it to the fridge, right? It's just that you're not going to leave the house. So then it's easier again to argue that makar choshech is not somehow a deadly endeavor. Okay, great. So notice what's happening here. Again, I argued in the beginning that this question of how deadly they are interfaces and intersects with all kinds of questions about the Makot. We've now seen that that's true on two levels, both in terms of larger patterns and structures about the Makot and in terms of how do we understand individual Makot, right? So we've had, I'll say, three of the former and two of the latter. We've had the question of when does the Torah say the Jews did not suffer? When does God warn the Egyptians? Okay, we had, why is the last unit? So those are three larger questions about the structural development of the Makot. But now we've also seen how this intersects with, well, what exactly are Tzvardea, right? Are they frogs? Are they crocodiles? How dangerous are they? And now the second Maka affected, what exactly was Makar Choshech? Was it this, again, restraining kind of Maka? Or was it just a lack of light? So individual sources, individual makot are also affected. Okay, let us get to the last part now. But, and maybe now, maybe I do have a little time. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about the Sfarno's humanitarian, humanitarian approach. And really there are many examples, but I'll just mention two. Okay, Rabbi Vadya Sfarno was an important Italian commentary in the late Middle Ages. And he says the following in a totally different context. Okay, the Sferna insists that the real plan when the Jews entered the land of Israel was not to have any war. It was not supposed to be a single battle, right? Had we been worthy, somehow the non-Jews would have relinquished the land. I guess they would have been you no know, uh, in awe of us or in fear of us, whatever the case may be, but no blood would have been spilled, right? That was what was supposed to happen. But because we sinned in Sefer Bar, so the plan shifted, 
And we had to have a more difficult entry into the land. And that more difficult entry to land involved military conflict as well. But I think it's not an accident that this Sferner says this. And if I ask what motivated it, so I admit it might be a combination of a literary point and of a humanitarian theological point. What's the literary point? So in Sefer Shmot, when God describes the entry to the land, it doesn't sound like there's a conflict so much, that we just enter the land and everything is smooth. It's only we get to the account later, when we get to Bamidbar and Dvarim, that all of a sudden it seems like there's going to be war and military conflict in our encounter of the land. And in fact, the Bible critics say that, you know, in classic Bible critic fashion, that the author in Shmot had one conception of how the entry into the land would work. And the later authors had a more military conception of how the entry would work. But the Sfarna would say, no, I could work this out in a unified theory of Humash, that Shmot is describing this ideal that was supposed to happen. We were supposed to not have to have any kind of military conflict in entering the land. And the later Humashim, unfortunately, reflect the way things actually played out that due to our backsliding, it became much more difficult and there was military conflict. Okay, one other example. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll do maybe two more examples. Okay, if one would look at the Sforno on the Sforno regarding Melechet Kamim Vigay Kadosh, right? So you might say right there, right, in Shmot Yutet, here's Matan Torah, here's the Jews' great moment. And we are being described as. Uh, a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. So this is a pasuk only about Jewish particularism, right? About how great uh, the Jews are. Okay, and here uh, Sfarna points out that no, even though it's the Melchon of the Kadoshim, you'll be a treasured nation. That it doesn't mean that uh, the other nations are not worthy, right? That he even says that if you'd be a skula and everybody else wouldn't be worthy, so then what's the point of being a skula? It's like you know. Being, you know, the smartest kid in uh, in the weakest class, right? It's like, you know, winning, you know, being the best baseball player in, you know, the lowest league, right? That's not so exciting. It's only because God really values all of humanity, right? Chaviv Adam Sheniver B'Tselem, beloved is man that he was created in the divine image. That's a universal point. Therefore, when Jews got the singularity of their mission, then you could say, Yudem Skulami Kol so I think those examples already reflect Svarna's approach, that he has, again, we have a lot of different attitudes to Gentiles in our tradition. And I won't deny that there are sources that are more negative about him, but the Svarna had this more positive approach. So again, we saw that manifest twice. One more example before we get to our issue. Interestingly enough, the Svarna does this even in, with the, in the middle of the Mako, and in a very fascinating way. Okay, what do we have in the middle of the Mako when God is warning about taking the animals in. So it says, here, let's find it. Okay. So uh, there's a very clear warning over here. And uh, God says, can you give me one more second here. So he when, regarding the barad, we have the warning. Remember, it's Maka seven, so there should be a warning. And God says, mm-hmm. If you leave out the animals and the men, so the bread will kill them. So bring them inside. So I admit the word mate does appear here, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily deadly because they're told to bring them inside. And those that feared God may have their pro. And this is the Avadavi Mekneu Ela Batim. Okay, so that is what you have here. Although it does say some did not do so and left them out, but certainly no one had to die here, right? Everybody is told to be brought inside. But interestingly enough, the Sverno says, you might say here that God is showing compassion for the animals and for the men, and particularly for the servants, right? It's the servants who are with the animals out there in the field. But the Sverno says something very interesting. You know why God said to bring in the animals? For the sake of the men. 
I mean, God wants to ensure that Paro and the Egyptian taskmasters and the Egyptian uh, arist aristocracy saves the life of their workers, saves the life of the slave population, of the lower classes. And since the Behema and the Adam go together, right, they're the ones who care for the animals. So by being told to bring the animals, that's really a means of saving the men as well. So I think once again, not that we're against being nice to animals, but this far and again, I think again, the humanitarian impulse is showing that he even interprets the bringing in the animals warning as a way of ensuring that the people are safe. So with that background, again, we have established the Sferna's humanistic tendencies. We've seen it in an ideal universe. We wouldn't have had to wage war with the seven Canaanite nations. We've seen it that even at the moment of our singular uh, excellence of Matan Torah, he emphasizes that Tzel Molochim is a universal symbol, that we're a skula, and that's only significant because everybody else matters also. Okay, and now we've seen that even the animals is a tactic, is a strategy towards saving humanity. Okay, so with all that being said, let us go back to the screen and uh, go back to share screen here and see for the Sfarno um, how he interprets the deadliness of the Mako. Okay, here we go. So we're now going to do the last source today. We are in source 14. Now, remember, we saw an earlier Sforno that said that the first nine were otot umoftim, or signs and wonders, and the last one was a punishment. So let's see here on the second line. Now, this is a Sforno from Perak Dalid, and let's see how he explains what's going to happen. Remember, we said that already Perak Dalid was an anticipation of Makat Bechorot. Says the Sforno, ki amna Makat Bechorot levada. That alone of all ten, Haita Lemishpat Onesh Lefaro, Mikola Makot. Only that one was a punishment. Of Ashara Makot, what were the others? Hayula Od Lumofate Laman Yashuvu. Now, again, before we saw it, just they were signed, but now we hear what the sign was. God wanted the Egyptians to do chuba, right? They, they get a chance, they get nine chances. Kiloyach boats bemot hamait. God does not want the people to die. He did not close in front of them the ways of tshuva. Now, again, obviously, there are other things we could discuss here. Okay, we could discuss what about hardening power's heart? Does hardening power's heart work against this idea that God is waiting for tshuva? But I think that could be dealt with, right? There are many different approaches to hardening power's heart. Uh, one famous approach is that God is restoring his freedom rather than removing his freedom. That given the overwhelming pressure of the Makot, it's not a free choice to uh, to let them go. It's almost like, you know, you keep beat, punching me till I do something. On some level, that's not a choice. But God made Paro stubborn or, you know, hardy enough that he could withstand all the damage of the Makot and still have freedom. Okay, so let's leave that aside. But clearly, for the Egyptian broader population, the Sfarna is saying that the Makod were a sign and a chance to do tshuva. And now what happens? Uh, so in, so he even talks about different, even talks about different levels of tshuva. They could have come to appreciate God's greatness, and then they would have done the higher level tshuva. But what happens in that tshuva? He says, Ka'amram avonot nechshavim lo kizkuyot. By tshuva me'av out of love can even convert transgressions to merits. O lefachot l'shuv kavadim. Maybe they'll do a lower tshuva. You know, repentance out of fear is still a repentance. It might not have the same transformative powers of tshuva out of love, but even that would be a kind of tshuva. So God is waiting for the Egyptians to recognize him on some level and repent. Ah, but finally what happens, even eventually according to the humanitarian svarna, and the drowning in the Amsuf, then indeed... That indeed was justice. That was a punishment. That was retributive justice. And obviously, it fits very well that the punishment part is meaning if the one of the worst things, or maybe the worst thing the Egyptians did was to throw Jewish male babies into the Nile. And notice that was a sin that wasn't just Paro. Because after Paro commands the Mialdot, it says, so everybody's involved in that. So maybe the poetic justice is that you kill innocent infants by throwing them in a body of water. So you yourself are suffer a death in water as well. 
So admittedly, I won't take it too far. I won't say the Sforna is never in favor of punishments, right? Makat Bechorot and Kriyat Yamsov involved punishing the Egyptians. But that was only after a long process of nine Makot, which were meant for Chuba. Now, he doesn't say it explicitly, but I think with the Sforna, one might say that none of the nine were deadly because they were not about punishment. They were about giving the Egyptians a chance. So now, just to sum up the entire process here, I think we have seen how this question really does impact on many other things. It impacts on structure of the makot, the sequence of the makot. It impacts on our understanding of individual makot, such as choshech and svardaya. And finally, it influences our thinking about the purpose of the makot, to the degree that there's a lot of killing earlier in the game. So maybe we're in punishment mode, maybe we're in retributive justice mode much earlier. And to the degree that really the deadliness pretty much waits for Makat Bechorot, then it's easier to develop Sforna's idea. And I just like to summarize what the classic we showed him have said. Uh, we have Ibn Ezra telling us that the first three are just minor nuisances. Okay, not so clear what the Ibn Ezra would say when things get more serious. We have the Ramban based on the warning pattern saying that there's six deadly ones before the final Maka. And we have the Barbanel finding a good deal of life-threatening makot plagues, okay, way before Makot Bechorot, right? He says the crocodile of the second plague, and he had borrowed an arba destroying the food supply. So for Ramban and Barbanel, there's a lot of death in the air before you get to Makot Bechorot. But the Sforna says, I agree with Rashbam that there are three sets of three, but I would actually say that there's really a certain sense where there's nine and one. And again, we brought literary evidence for that, right? Maka Bechor being singled out in Shemot Dalet, Maka Bechor being isolated uh, with a break in the action from the other nine in Shemot Yudbet. And therefore, I think it's more convincing. And then one can say what this runner says, that nine of them are to get the Egyptians to change their ways, to repent. And finally, you know, everybody runs out of chances at some point. Finally, get to Maka 10, and that indeed is the punishment, which carries through Kriya Yamsuf as well. Uh, so I think, again, we've seen how a lot of issues interrelate and how uh, this question of whether they're deadly might affect our thinking and could reflect different outlooks and how God is relating to the broader Egyptian population. And those of you like me who perhaps have a certain affinity for humanitarianism, who are more drawn to those sources that are more positive about the Gentile world and not as negative. So I think this Svarna really works well for us, right? Uh, we've seen it's a larger theme in the Svarna, right? Again, war in Israel and uh, Matan Torah. But here, the Svarna, I think, again, uh, really impacts on his reading of the Makot, that God does not hate the Gentile world. He would like them to also, you know, be part of a, an ethical and religious mission. And... Uh, we go through uh, Sefer Shmo, we see different kinds of non-Jews. Sefer Shmo has a Malik, and it also has Yitro, and they're juxtaposed, right? In Perak Yud Zion, we have a Malik being, as it were, the epitome of evil. And right after that, we have Yitro being a non-Jew who, you know, is incredibly helpful to Moshe and Am Yisrael. So that dialectic is always at work. And the Sfarna gives us a nice reading of the Makot, and it may be for the Sfarna, we have nine troubling Makot, uh, meant to get people to do tshuva, and only get to Maka Bechora to the Mako turn deadly. Okay, so this is a recorded cheer, so I guess I can't take questions now, but I hope you all enjoyed it, and uh, if anyone would like to, you know, email me with follow-up questions, okay, so my email is, uh, I'll give you the easy one, yitzchakblau2 at gmail.com. I would love to hear your feedback about the shear, what you liked, what you didn't like, any comments or questions, and everybody should continue to uh, enjoy learning Torah.